Good morning. I'm Jacqueline Brown from the University of Washington in Seattle. And I'm also a member of the Pacific Northwest Gigapop. We're a large regional network in the northwest of the U.S. And Pacific Wave, which is an international exchange point, again, in Seattle, as well as in Los Angeles. My colleague, John Sylvester, represents Pacific Wave Los Angeles there. Uh, you've seen these slides over and over again. I can't stand to turn off my mobile, but if you can put it on vibrate, it will be helpful. Um, and if you could turn off the, side, the sound on your PC, so it doesn't play pretty tunes while you read your email, that would be helpful as well. We have four speakers, actually, today. So you have four for the price of three. Beyond the ones uh, who are in your program, you, we also have Professor Shimizu, Shimizu-san from uh, Kyushu University in Japan. And uh, he will give you five minutes of introduction to his demo, which will take place in room Bach, uh, down the corridor here, uh, right after our, pre our session here. So I will keep my introduction short. You can always read the information in the program or on the website. This session is being webcast, so obviously our colleagues outside of this room do not have the program except on the web, but all the information is there. Our first speaker is Malcolm Teague from Janet. Malcolm. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, speak to you today. Um, I'm Malcolm Teague, and I, I, do, I work for Janet UK uh, in, in the UK, and uh, I have a, an unusual title of NHS, National Health Service, HE, Higher Education Coordinator. Um, and um, I think I'm one of the few people who actually work right in the, at the interface between the two um, sectors, and the main focus is that interface. Um, and, and the post that uh, I have was uh, initially joint funded by both the Health Service and uh, well, the Joint Information Systems Committee on behalf of uh, Janet. Uh, my talk today is about a particular project primarily that we, we've been doing to try and interconnect uh, the health network in, the, well, in England and Scotland actually, but uh, I'm putting the context of the UK um, and, um, and the Janet network. Um, but in, to do that, I wanted to, um, first of all, oops, I must be pressing something here. Hang on a second. Um, I, I need to uh, give an overview of uh, the various sort of models of infrastructure for health um, around Europe because um, the UK has a, a particular sort of model and it's not necessarily the same elsewhere. Um, there is, a, uh, as many of you will have already seen the Uranus report, there's a special uh, report as part of that on, uh, that includes the healthcare sector, and this is uh, a good source of reference, but I've, I'm briefly um, going to go through that as well. Um, and um, obviously, a lot, this is in the, sec, uh, the session, what is behind, and there's nothing sort of new technically in this, because what uh, I'm really going to be describing is what's been allowed, not is what is technically possible, uh, given the sort of information governance requirements uh, in this field. Right. Um, my post came about really because of the frustration with the problems of interconnectivity between the health and um, education research networks in the UK. Um, this is sometimes leading to what is called the 2PC syndrome, where the large number of uh, health service clinicians who are also involved in either education and research um, quite often will have um, a one PC uh, in, connected to the health network and another PC connected to the university network, not necessarily and sometimes by uh, policy not in the same room. Um, not necessarily in the same building. So a very complicated lives when these people are very, very highly pressured anyway uh, to have to manage um, this sort of lack of system interoperability. But of course we recognize the uh, security information governance needs of something as sensitive as, as health service data. Um, that's, that's um, <clears throat> 
The, um, the, the, the national uh, approaches um, that uh, I broadly sort of categorized today are, firstly, there's the uh, using the National Education Research Network to deliver health uh, support as well. And a particular example here is Denmark. Uh, two years ago at this conference, uh, Martin Beck gave a presentation on that, and I've referred you to that because uh, uh, I think it's a very ex um, you know, exciting way of achieving um, health connectivity using the one network. Uh, and they've um, used something called the um, connection agreement system to facilitate that. Um, I also could spend some time today talking about that, but it's, it, that's a Denmark uh, presentation and, and it is, it's on that reference. One thing that's um, appeared recently in uh, the UK, one of the UK countries, Wales, they have uh, just signed a contract for a public sector broadband aggregation network where health is going to be in one tier of the, uh, of the network and education and research on another. It still doesn't solve the interconnectivity problem in the sense that uh, although they're sharing um, equipment and fibers, etc., there's still a need to agree what can be shared between the different layers. Um, then there's the uh, model which, um, oops, this is going, sorry, jumping about here. Um, there's the model which is perhaps more typical where there is a separate uh, national health network, uh, separate from the educational research network, and that's certainly the case in uh, the UK countries and I believe in uh, quite a few of uh, the other European countries like Sweden. So it seems to be moving about on its own accord. I'm very sorry about this. Um, and then there's a sort of hybrid, uh, which I put as number four there, where um, there is a, partly a separate health network, but also um, there are initiatives to uh, extend the uh, National Research and Education Network out to uh, at least some of the um, health sites, uh, particularly university hospitals. I'm thinking there of initiatives in Italy and uh, in Brazil, for instance, where there is a, um, the, the, the Ministry of Health in Italy have, very, you know, have been um, very keen to use the power of the GAR network uh, out to the university hospitals. Um, and um, before I move on, I suppose I should say that yesterday I discovered that uh, there, are, there is another model which perhaps I should have mentioned, and that is the sort of situation that I believe you have in Belgium, where there's more of a sort of commercial model within the health, uh, sorting health networking, um, and uh, a much more diverse sort of uh, set of different providers. And I guess that is uh, a little bit the same in the U.S., um, so that's uh, perhaps another model. If there are other people here who don't recognize these models and have one uh, that they think they should be included, I'll be very pleased to uh, talk to you about that. Right. In, um, in England, and uh, actually Scotland as well, there are two separate contracts. There is a new uh, broadband network for the health service. It's called N3, and... Um, it is uh, provided by BT. It's a very large uh, contract, and uh, you can see uh, this is a slide actually from uh, British Telecom uh, so it's about how big it is. But um, <coughs> it's, it's a very substantial um, network, and it, it has been now fully implemented, um, and it uses the uh, British Telecom um, infrastructure. Um, and this has been put in place to support the uh, sort of e-health uh, main uh, systems, uh, particularly this is uh, particularly in England. Um, uh, for instance, um, there's a, been a major push on delivering picture and uh, archiving and communication systems, of the electronic radiology systems, out to every uh, hospital in um, in England. So I'm now going to talk about um, this particular project that uh, we've been doing in the UK, bearing in mind that we have this separate health and um, education research uh, networks. Now this um, is just a, just a diagram showing the, the two separate networks. Um, on the health side, in the sort of uh, lavender color, <laughs> we have N3, which is the health network, and that um, has, you know, is the same for England and Scotland. Uh, Wales and Northern Ireland have their own uh, approaches to health networks, but they are interlinked into that, to the health network in England and Scotland. 
And on the other side there, uh, in the yellow, of course, there is the uh, Education and Research Network, Janet, which covers uh, all the home countries of the UK. Um, and traditionally, they, well, they, ha they both have it, obviously, interconnects into the internet. Um, but what um, we wanted to do was to, and they had, was put in a gateway which really managed the interface between these two major networks uh, without having to, um, or sort of get away from the difficulties of putting in lots of local um, solutions, uh, which are, were quite difficult to do, uh, relatively expensive, difficult to manage, and um, potentially unsustainable. And we feel there is a real need for a strategic approach. So the, the objectives of this um, project, I'll do them up all at once, um, really was to, to find projects to act as pathfinders to um, uh, use the infrastructure, um, to demonstrate, we, everybody was saying that this was a real problem, but it was very difficult to get any quantitative information about how difficult a problem and what we should be doing to, to solve it. So we've taken this pathfinder approach where we know people have specific things they want to do. We try and support them doing that through this project and then learn um, from that. And this is a one-year um, contract and it's a chance to develop a relationship really with the health service and to build up their trust um, in us because they do tend to have this vision of education research involving lots of uh, people in genes sort of uh, with their feet on the table playing around with open source systems and uh, not, don't really necessarily realize the sort of true professionalism that um, happens in, in the uh, NRENs. As I said, this is not really about the, the sort of, the, you know, the f being at the forefront of technical solutions. Essentially, this is a big firewall um, with an intrusion protection service, and it is uh, based in London. It's 100 megabits for this early adopter approach. As of today, that uh, infrastructure is in place, and it's being used for four early adopters. Um, some of that uh, early adoption has been sort of transferred, really, from going out through to the Internet to using this gateway instead. Um, but some of it is new um, and wasn't previously allowed with the Internet Gateway. At the moment, from information governance requirements, um, we um, haven't been uh, able to do more than the sessions initiated within the health side, going out to the university side or the higher education side. Uh, but we're hoping to build on that and go the other way as well. Um, these are the, the uh, adopters we have at the moment. Um, I'm just going to put them all up because uh, we're a bit short of time. Uh, the first is um, five universities in the northeast of England, and they're NHS partners. Uh, they have a lot of um, students that have to go out on clinical placements as part of their undergraduate courses in health, various health sciences, including medicine, nursing, etc. Um, and they wanted a more robust and dedicated um, support for those students um, out in those placement areas. But they are particularly interested in the video conferencing, which I'll come to again in a minute. The University of Bristol uh, and the University West of England in the sort of uh, counties of Avon, Somerset, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, um, in the southwest of England, uh, they had um, uh, their own infrastructure, essentially their own network, put into the uh, main NHS trust hospital organizations in their area. Um, but using the power of the N3 network, with the, which the hospitals already are connected to, they could avoid having that separate infrastructure to manage. And they were using a, uh, using a Citrix uh, type solution to deliver their university services. Um, the University of Birmingham um, is actually a collection of um, primary care research data um, from GP general practitioners, primary care pr practitioners out in the community. So it's actually collecting, in this particular case, patient identifiable data, which was a significant breakthrough, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. And the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute collect uh, data on chromosomal, chromosomal anomalies uh, from uh, health service clinicians, and they were finding that the uh, previous access just through the internet gateway just wasn't sufficient to uh, give good response times to uh, uh, to, to make the clinicians want to actually do that reporting. Uh, we're quite excited about the ones coming up. The Janet video conferencing um, is currently not possible other than using ISDN to do video conferencing uh, between the two sectors um, uh, uh, 
it's not possible to do video conferencing. Uh, we'll be using H323 protocols, and we've been, it's been agreed that we will be allowed to use the um, Education Research's Janet Video Conferencing Service uh, for the NHS as well, and they are going to be allowed just through the firewall to actually manage that. Um, <clears throat> So I mentioned the information governance was particularly important, um, uh, something that's happened uh, to make this, uh, I think, better for us in our project is that there's been a change in the arrangements for this and there is now a sort of um, a self-assessment um, approach against a set of guidelines uh, that you have to sort of sign up to. Uh, each NHS trust or NHS organisation has to sign up and anybody connecting to N3 has to sign up to. Um, and um, there, there is the potential of audit, but it, it does put the responsibility more on the local organisation um, than on uh, some central body to agree uh, different changes, which was what happened before. Um, at first, they thought they might have to ask each university to um, uh, sign a statement of compliance too, um, even if they are just really doing the equivalent of going out onto the internet. Uh, then they realised that the internet gateway um, really allowed people to go out anyway to such sites then, uh, and that has changed, and we, we know how we do, the universities don't have to do their own statement of compliance, uh, but when we start to go the other way, then that certainly will be the case. Um, <clears throat> to summarize on where we are then, we, one of the things we realized as we were going through and talking to the health service about getting agreement to do these things, that uh, there were these sort of four categories of uh, types of application that we needed to consider. Um, at the moment, as I already said, we only allow to do the sessions initiated on the health side, uh, which is the sort of easy bit, in British commas. Um, and whether, so it's whether, uh, and the other aspect is whether patient identifiable data is involved or not. Um, initially, we were only in the top left corner, and now we're in the top left and the bottom uh, left corners of uh, things that we're allowed to do. Um, and in terms of collecting research data and patient identifiable data uh, in this way, that those things are already covered by research ethic approval and um, local uh, agreements about what um, is possible. But we are investigating the, the bluer, blue boxes as well. Um, that's just a summary of uh, the access out from uh, sessions initiated N3. Well, what, what would be a session initiated on the sort of Janet side uh, not involving patient identifiable data? Well, there are quite a lot of, in, thank you, uh, there's quite a lot of um, uh, general uh, library and knowledge management resources that um, are difficult to get to from outside the health network. Um, and some of this is due to using um, sort of the N3 IP address range as the uh, authentication method, mechanism for getting into those resources. Um, so there is the idea, that, I mean, in, in, the, in the long term, we would hope that the uh, health service would move to federated identities as the education research um, is doing. But in the short term, there may be some um, benefit of some, a proxy server. So that's something we're investigating. But the, um, the real... Uh, thing we'd like to get to is access to NHS clinical systems where appropriate um, through, the, through the gateway. Um, and this really splits into two uh, types, those people where the health service staff who have a, a role in clinical services um, who need to get back to their um, systems when they're in, on a Janet site. And the second is um, more the re research uh, researcher who is based on a Janet organization who needs access to um, uh, patient identifiable data through their research protocols. And uh, we were sort of separating those two because they um, are slightly different issues to, uh, to crack. Um, but with the NHS, certainly in England, they have a smart card for all the clinicians who are going to access the national health uh, clinical uh, systems and we hope to be able to allow that from a Janet site just as um, we can uh, get, you know, use the card readers to get back to, uh, back to those systems. So um, essentially we're, we're, we're working on this gateway, we're evaluating what we've done so far. We're going to extend, I believe, from the, the one year because we haven't learned all the lessons we need as yet, but we are making a business case for um, taking this on into the future, and we have now quite a lot of interest from the health service itself in this. And I think they see, the, although I don't think we'll ever do a, um, 
uh, Denmark. Um, I, I think they, they can see some real benefits in sharing. Um, can we use the gateway uh, approach for other public service networks? Well, one thing that, although there is a big issue about information governance and connecting to N3, N3 or the health service themselves do consider their network as, as hostile, which means that, um, as does as Janet, would be considered hostile. Um, and that does mean that um, there is more chance of interplay between the two systems because the security can be built into the applications and not the network. Um, that's not necessarily the stance that's taking place in some of the other government department networks where the security is very much um, in the, uh, by being on the network itself. So I don't think that would happen there. Um, is the internet sufficient? Should we just be using that? Uh, I think the answer uh, is not yet. Maybe one day all systems will be uh, internet enabled. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. Are there any questions for Malcolm? If not, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Carl Kesselman. Carl comes from Los Angeles. He is the director for the Center for Grid Technologies at ISI, the Information Sciences Institute. Okay, all we need are some slides. Oh, do I just hit next here? Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing in uh, distribution of medical images. Uh, in particular, we've been looking at using grid middleware technologies as a vehicle for doing this. And uh, this has turned out to be actually a very effective approach, uh, and we're dealing with some very practical problems here. So I'm going to uh, spend the next few minutes and tell you what we've been up to. Oh, and I should point out this is joint work with myself and a number of other people, particularly Stefan Eberish, who's at the Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and a number of people in my group, and Jonathan Silverstein from uh, University of Chicago. Okay, so here's the problem. So we're going to focus on something very concrete and specific here, and, and in some sense this is pretty straightforward. What's that? They're moving. Ah, this thing's got a mind of its own. All right, so here's the problem we want to solve. In some sense, it's very simple. We want to take an image that's located in Hospital A, and we need to move it to Hospital B so a doctor at this other hospital um, can get access to this remote record. Okay, now it turns out this is something that, that um, is, in fact, difficult, if not impossible, to do right now other than physically transferring media. And it turns out to be very important. It shows up in a lot of use cases that are very practical. Second opinions, people um, going for treatment in other hospitals, supporting clinical trials. So there's a variety of situations where the ability to access image-based records at a remote hospital comes into play here. Um, so the solution that we're going to uh, uh, take here is what we're going to do is leverage uh, a grid technology, basically what we want to do is create a virtual overlay where we can allow remote access to the records. It's fairly straightforward. Now, the issues, as we heard in the previous talk, there are a number of issues with regard to security and privacy that need to be uh, taken care of. We need to then figure out how we're going to keep track of where the various images are. Uh, we need to do the underlying kind of low-level nuts and bolts issues of how do we move data from one place to the other. So let's investigate how we can go about doing this. So, as it turns out, images are quite an interesting starting point for looking at applications of networking into, um, into uh, the medical uh, process. And the reason why is because there's a long history of already pushing um, imaging modalities into the digital domain. Radiologists were very early to adapt uh, digital data formats. There's actually a well-defined imaging format. They basically don't use film anymore. Film is essentially just for printing. It's, it, the data is always al already captured digitally. Um, there's a, an existing IT infrastructure in the hospital for handling management of images. So it turns out it's a very good place to start. This thing is just... Uh, uh, taking off all by itself. So, as it turns out, there's a well-established format that has been defined by radiologists for describing and interchanging 
images within the enterprise. And this is something called DICOM, which stands for Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine. So what DICOM actually defines is a standard file format with some header information and a standard representation of the underlying bits in the images. Right? And these images could be for CT, it could be for MRI, it could be for ultrasound. There's a wide pet, pet um, there's a wide variety of imaging modalities for which uh, the, these can be, uh, DICOM is used. And it defines a simple but um, kind of broken communication protocol for actually moving the images between the devices. So it's, it's uh, kind of computationally inefficient. There's uh, uh, no, very little security. There's a number of reasons why this protocol is, is uh, kind of restricted. But the good news is that if you go into an existing hospital today or a doctor's office, a radiologist's office today, there is existing commercial equipment already been deployed that allows you to store, retrieve, view, acquire. This thing is just crazy. All right, so this thing is now completely ignoring my commands. There we go. So there is within the existing enterprise an extensive infrastructure for managing these images in digital format. So that's something that's very important. Now, on the other hand, on the wide area space, there's been a lot of work going on in building out standards or de facto standards-based infrastructure for doing resource sharing at the wide area. Um, in particular, what, what's been called grid infrastructure. We heard a little bit about it in the plenary yesterday. And in particular, we're interested in a, in a set of, um, of service-oriented architecture-based infrastructure called the Globus Toolkit. I'm not going to go into detail about this. Um, hopefully, you've heard about the Globus Toolkit. But what it provides is a set of services that give you the basic building blocks for how one goes and discovers and federates and moves information, accesses computation in a wide area. And if you're not familiar, Globus is, is currently being used uh, to support very large-scale, global-scale production infrastructures for for example, the uh, LHC experiments at CERN for gravity wave experiments uh, at uh, actually in Germany, Italy, and the U.S. Um, for a number of commercial uh, EU-funded commercial activities and so on. So this is a widely used wide area infrastructure. So what we need to do is to figure out how to combine then the existing local area infrastructure that's in place in the hospital. And what we want to do is then use this wide area grid glue to be able to essentially integrate or federate these local area environments to build essentially this virtual image repository and image management system. So what we're going to do is we're going to split this into a couple of basic pieces. What we're going to do is we're first of all going to figure out how to connect the hospital up into the wide area plumbing. And to do that, we're going to create something we call a DICOM grid interface service. We're going to need to do discovery and keep track of what's where now that we've built this kind of virtualized overlay. And for that, we're going to create a, a, a global metadata catalog uh, based on some tech, tech technology that was actually EU funded that came out of uh, the UK called uh, OGSA DAI. And then we're going to utilize, I'm going to skip this data replication stuff. Uh, I will talk a little bit about then how we're going to use some of the work that's, that's gone on and how to do attribute-based um, uh, authorization and uh, authentication to then allow us to federate these, these various healthcare environments together to allow uh, controlled access to the various images that are available. So... The goal here is that what we want to do is essentially take what's currently a localized function within the hospital called PACS, which is Picture Archiving Service. So this is a normal, this is a storage environment that typically exists in the hospital for holding images. And essentially what we want to do is turn that into a utility. We want to push it out onto the network and essentially use the network as providing this PACS functionality into the hospital. Um, and we want to do that then to support a variety of use cases, not just not just research use cases, but also clinical use cases as well. Um, so let's, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into actually the details of this. Let me talk about the bits and pieces that go in here. 
So the main idea that we have within this system is something we call a DICON Globus Interface Service. And at, at a high level, this is a fairly straightforward idea. What we want to do is take the local protocols that exist within the confines of the hospital, which were based on this DICOM standard, and we want to convert them into wide area protocols that have the, that utilize the, the data management and the data discovery and the security mechanisms that we find in these grid middlewares. So what we've done is produced essentially a gateway service, which takes operations using the local protocols, these DICOM protocols, and converts them into wide area protocols. So it's essentially just a protocol converter. Right? So what this, though, allows us to do is to create this gateway that lives within the, the hospital boundary that converts, that allows us to take the existing invested infrastructure, investment in the infrastructure in the hospital, and basically to federate that in a completely transparent way into the wide area. So let me show you an um, Oh, I thought there was another picture in here. Okay, so that's, that's uh, I'll show you how this fits in in the overall workflow in just a moment. So the other half of this is, so we've taken these local operations and we've converted it into the wide area operations. Then the other piece of the puzzle that we're going to need is from the wide area to figure out how to discover what bits and pieces are where. And to do that, we leverage another piece of the, of the DICOM format, which is there's some existing metadata that's a standard part of the DICOM record. So rather than having to argue and fight about the schema and what goes where and the metadata formats and so on, this is actually well-defined. And this is actually what they essentially has happened is part of the electronic health record is, is a, is a inserted into this image file, as, and it's actually generated when, when the radiology images are taken. This is actually generated into the, uh, inserted into these files as part of the data acquisition. So essentially what we want to do then is to extract that information and publish it in a way that now makes it searchable um, from the wide area. So to do that, what we do is create a globally accessible catalog, and we're leveraging some technology that was developed at the University of Edinburgh um, with EU funding, actually, called uh, DAI, uh, for it stands for Data Access and Integration. And what we do is extract information from the DICOM records, make it available through this uh, through this, uh, di uh, this uh, di, di service, which now provides a standard service-oriented in uh, interface to the header information from the DICOM file. So we've got two pieces now, right? So we have this ability to basically convert the local, local operations into global operations, and then as part of the, then we have this, uh, uh, this catalog where we can store the various um, images that are available within the, the, the network cloud. And then as part of the standard grid infrastructure, we have tools for doing data movement and data, uh, uh, data access. We're going to combine these things together, and that's going to give us our network, our grid-enabled PACS functionality. So I think here we have some examples of how this is going to work. So this will hopefully clarify the story for you a little bit. So within DICOM, there is an operation called CFIND. So this is a local kind of... It's actually an IP-based operation um, where somebody, for example, at a display workstation says, tell me all of the records that are available with this particular patient number, or it uses a, a study, it has something called a study number or a series number. So you can go and say, give me all the studies that are available that have this characteristic, or all the, the series uh, from this patient and so on. So that's a local request. And typically what happens is you would go to the local hospital PACS environment. It does very stupid brain-dead authorization based on the IP address of the requester. Um, it leverages something that, that within the hospital they have something called covered consent. So basically as long as you can sit in front of this workstation, you're basically allowed to access the records is more or less how it works. And, and that's what would normally happen within the hospital environment. But what we've done then is we masquerade as, as a, a PAC system, one of these picture archiving systems within the hospital, but what we in fact do is take that CFIND request, and in this case do a very straightforward conversion, into a metadata a catalog query, which we then send over the wide area using our existing authentication infrastructure, which is based on X.509 public key infrastructure with delegation and all kinds of wonderful stuff that, that we've done uh, over the past decade or so. So we authenticate to the, uh, 
this uh, metadata server. We convert the DICOM request into a standard SQL, in this case SQL query. We send it using um, the, um, the web services to find protocols that have been developed for DAI. We get the result back. We reformat it so it looks like the response from a CFIN request for DICOM. We push it back to the workstation and everyone's happy. Now, the thing to realize here is this workstation is a commercial, you know, FDA, government-approved radiology workstation for doing real clinical diagnosis, right? So what we've done is we've been able to kind of insert ourselves into the, into the, the existing infrastructure and converted it to the wide area protocols, and nobody's the wiser. All right, so what happens next? Now I actually want to look at some of the data. So we use a DICOM request called CMOVE or CGET. Um, in this case, we say, okay, now I want to see this image. So what happens? Again, we, we figure out where the image happens to be. We get back the location. And then we use, in this case, um, some image, image uh, some data uh, trans uh, movement operations that we've defined as part of the grid protocols to essentially transfer over the wide area. This, this is using something called grid FTP, which you might be familiar with. So it's, a, it's an authenticated, very high performance data mover. Um, so basically to move the data from a storage location that happens to be in the network cloud to the local gateway service where then um, we make it available to the workstation. Now we're also doing something a little bit clever in here as this is ongoing is DICOM is a very inefficient protocol. It stores each image in a separate file. Some of these files can be quite small. So in fact what we do is format conversion where we take multiple files, we aggregate them into containers, we can then encrypt or compress the containers to get better network performance, and that's in fact what we, stop, uh, what we uh, have available on the network. So once we do something like this, this allows all, all kinds of tricks we can play. So for example, one of the standard things we have within the grid infrastructure is a replica, a name, a replica location service where we can essentially do multiple URI to URL. This thing is just nuts, sorry. We can basically map multiple URIs to URLs, right? So this allows us to do, for example, replication and caching and failure recovery. Um, so we're in fact in the middle of building a, a, a doing a, a demonstration right now where we're doing local caching in the case where you want to do um, uh, workload distribution across multiple hospitals. Um, so once you, once you kind of inject this stuff into the wide area, there's all kinds of interesting things that you can do using standard techniques that we've developed from the research and science space for doing data management, data caching, data replication, all the standard data management stuff. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but we can also then drive our, essentially a write uh, a store workflow as well, where now when we've done acquisition and we want to pub essentially publish um, the image to make it available for re remote uh, access. So in this case, obviously, the first thing we do is we push uh, the header information into the catalog, and then we push the actual bits out into a, um, an off-site storage environment. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about some of the security work that's ongoing. Um, you know, as was mentioned earlier, there's an issue of what's, uh, what we call protected health information. There's in the United States, there's, there's actually, uh, as I'm sure in most countries, there, there's a body of law that, that restricts the access to uh, private information about a patient. And in the U.S., uh, it, it's quite intriguing that the... Um, the information is actually owned by the patient. So it's the patient that controls access to the information. This thing is really making me nuts here. Um, it's the patient that actually owns the information. It's the hospital, the healthcare provider, that's the steward of the information. So it's basically up to the patient to tell, to, to give permission to the healthcare provider that they want you to see your records. And this is actually quite interesting because if you think about it as networking people, right? It's actually a problem in delegation, right? So what it is is I, patient A, would like to delegate to hospital B the access to my records that happen to be sitting right now at hospital A. So what we've been able to do is apply some of the work that's been ongoing in this community and the grid community and attribute-based authorization infrastructures using things literally like shibboleth and SAML and so on and apply that to the access of patient, uh, patient uh, private health information. 
Um, so our, our original deployment was based on a, basically a um, authorization-based model using S.509 certificates, public key infrastructure, kind of standard stuff out of the, the grid environment. Um, and that gives you basically a closed, uh, supports the implementation of a closed network where essentially you have a, a single provider and all you want to do is make sure of the uh, identity of the people on the other side of the network. But what we're doing now is extending that to use these, uh, it's just... Well, it's, it's actually just spontaneously doing it all by itself, I think. It's, uh, see if I just put it here. I won't touch it. <laughs> so what we're doing now is applying these ideas of attribute-based authorization models to deal with the more general case where a patient shows up at an unaffiliated hospital and wants to say, since I'm the owner of this information, I want this, this third party now to have access to my information. Um, so... This is a rather confusing picture, but it gives you the basic idea is that what we want to do, so this really comes into this idea of virtual organizations that we've been exploring in the grid space now for quite some time. See, I didn't touch it, and it just, so, so the idea here is what we're actually doing is creating an over, a security overlay where we're allowing dynamically to bind together these independent parties into, into one integrated trust domain. And we do this by leveraging all kinds of things that uh, you're, I'm sure, quite familiar with here. Sorry. In our case, we're heavily leveraging a lot of the web's, uh, WS security um, specifications that have come out of OASIS and the W3C. Now, what we're leveraging is some very nice plumbing that's been um, evolving in the Globus Toolkit based around these ideas of attributes everywhere. So what we've done is basically within the framework of our infrastructure, we've now built some very general mechanisms for collecting attributes either via push or via pull um, and, cl and, and collecting them up into one place and then pushing them out into a, a PDP for doing, uh, for doing policy enforcement. So now what we have is... is is essentially a generic framework where we can go out to a lot of policy information points, get information as SAML attributes, get them uh, online from shibboleth servers, get them through, uh, through uh, actually attributes that are shoved into um, uh, X.509 certificates using an attribute extension we've de developed through the IETF. So we have now very generic plumbing for collecting up all this security information and then pushing it out to a decision point. So now think how we can apply this to the healthcare space. So it becomes in some sense very simple. A patient shows up at, at a hospital. They want access to the records. They basically provide a, a attributes to the doctor at that hospital or the healthcare provider saying, I authorize you to access my records. You go back to the source where those records are located. You present your your authentication as being a valid healthcare provider, and you present the attributes, certificates, or the, the attribute assertions from the patient saying the patient has authorized you to access their records, right? And now you're in a position where you can make a, 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 um, a access decision to, to provide um, access to those records. And so we're in the process, oh, this is actually a picture showing you cut all the different things once you have this general plumbing that you can apply it to. So you'll probably recognize uh, a number of these technologies uh, from uh, many of them are deployed on the, the networks here. So without going into great detail, you can now, actually I'm not going to go into any detail here, but essentially what we've done is we've now built a policy decision point we call the Hippocratic Verification Service that essentially just collects up these attributes and applies the policy for in the U.S. of what's called HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability Act, um, which are the rules that determine who can access the data. And now what we have is a very general infrastructure for supporting a wide variety of use cases, everything from research cases where you've tended to anonymize the data and basically there's no private health information in it, all the way to the clinical case where you actually want to do this fine-grained access control based on patients allowing you to explicitly give you permission. And we can support everything from the clinical to the research in the single underlying sharing infrastructure, which is actually, I think, quite unique. So... 
we're actually applying this to a, a range of use cases right now. The original thing we did was to support um, clinical trials, something called central review for clinical trials. And in this case, what happens is images uh, are produced as part of a, a, a treatment regime um, at a variety of, of participating institutions. These images get published as part of the trial protocol. The information gets anonymized, and then they're distributed to remote radiologists for something called centralized review. So essentially, they need to look at the images and decide, you know, are the tumors getting bigger or smaller? Right? So if you think of it, this as a fundamentally network-based operation. How is this done right now? They literally ship around CDs. So the hospital literally generates a CD with the image on it, sends it to the, the administrator of the clinical trial. Right? They then have to anonymize it, generate a new CD, send it to the radiologist for remote review. And this adds to the expense, it adds to the, the time, and so on. Um, we're also actually in the process of, of, of working in a clinical environment as well, and we're focusing right now on large networks of healthcare providers, in particular in the, in the military health service within the United States, which is, again, networks of distributed hospitals, global. It's actually a global network of hospitals. In this case, they're actually quite interested in doing workload sharing. So the ability to flexibly move around and just discover images in this scenario is, um, is quite important. This shows, actually, this is a somewhat old map showing, actually, the footprint of what we currently have deployed. Right now, we have 40 hospitals in the Child's Oncology Group and the Neuroblastoma Cancer Foundation, where we're using this technology uh, to basically facilitate image sharing, in this case, uh, for the clinical trials use case, which is with the anonymized images, so you don't need any of this fancy attribute-based security mechanisms. Uh, but this is in production and being used to support right now phase one clinical trials for various cancer drugs. Um, so in summary, what, what I've described is how you can use not just the underlying kind of high performance networks and plumbing, but by building appropriate services on top of that. And we heard a bit about that in the plenary yesterday, I would say, but right, injecting the right standard services on top of that, in this case, standard grid services that we use for high energy physics and global change research and, and you know, generic science, we're applying that to now actual the practice of, of healthcare. And, you know, the clever thing is, I think that that's happened here is then looking at very carefully the interfaces between what happens in the enterprise, what happens in the wide area, very carefully engineering those interfaces and the conversions of the workflows from the local area to the wide area, and then being able to provide these genuinely useful capabilities um, that that are in essence tra totally transparent to the end user because you've done that careful engineering on the interface. And so, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's basically it. Right, I'll stop with that. Thank you, Carl. Lovely technology. Are there any questions for Carl? Yes? So uh, maybe the mobility in the U.S. is much bigger than in Europe. So how often happened that the patient is coming from east to west and or I mean the data from east to west for them, okay? Because uh, we implement your system in our country and you will, you will hear the, the, uh, our presentation over here. And this is a big problem that the doctors don't want to use it because they say, uh, okay, we don't need it so often. Okay, so. Yeah, I would say actually our experience is it happens all the time. Um, I don't know how things work here in the U.S. Things like imaging is, is more and more frequently outsourced. The hospitals, you know, the, their imaging centers, right, that actually are not part of the hospital. And there's this notion of moving the images um, from these imaging centers into the hospital. The doctors have offices that are maybe in affiliated buildings, remote buildings. They need to, um, you know, want to get the images in their offices rather than being as part of the hospital. Um, I, I, in fact, was, it was interesting. I was interviewing a guy to, to uh, run our development group. He says, you know what, I'm very interested in this problem. He says, my son has cancer, and he goes to school in Boston, and he, was in Los, and he was in Los Angeles, he wanted to get treatment at City of Hope. He had to go to Mass General, 
get his records in the CD and carry his records with him, right, on the airplane from Boston to Los Angeles to get treatment. And this was just a guy who showed up, you know, just how. So, so I think it, it happens quite a bit. own the data, uh, how do you make sure that really the data must be authorized by myself? By myself? Uh, how, how does the technically? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there's many levels of detail you could get into, but at, just superficially, we, um, you know, we are leveraging kind of a rooted trust model where there are, um, so at the point of access, there's a policy decision point, which is based on the SAML assertion technology. So what we get are these cryptographically assigned assertions, which actually um, come from uh, attribute authorities, which are, you know, have a rooted trust domain, so they're all coming from a, uh, a certificate authority of some sort, right? So, so basically we collect up these cryptographically assigned assertions and we validate them at the point of, at the point of access, right? So we kind of do all the standard stuff to, to trace back to the trust route and, and determine that, yes, in fact, this attribute authorizing access by this physician was issued by the owner of the, uh, the, owner of the, the medical record. Does that answer your question? No, well, maybe we can, maybe we can take it offline then. Yeah. What about the emergency situations? Yeah, so there is always an emergency. Actually, there's an emergency override requirement. So this is for, for again, access control. We're not encrypting right now. We don't encrypt the records uh, at the endpoint. So there, um, it's straightforward to encode a policy override uh, into the policy decision point that implements the access control. Well, I was wonder, wondering, do you see the two sets of problems? One is the technology problem that you seem to have solved very nicely. The other is often the cultural problem where, in my experience, often practitioners and in particular the regulators don't trust all this stuff and don't believe that it works and stuff. I'm wondering or, or I'm interested in hearing what's your experience with this? Yeah, so this is, right, so there's, there's two answers to that question. So first of all, this is one of the beautiful things about radiology is they're already sitting in front of computers. They already have workstations, right? So the important thing we've done by using DICOM, we don't change the workflow that the practitioner sees at all. There is, it's totally transparent from their perspective. They sit in front of their GE or their Fuji or their AFCA, you know, display station, packs environment, they use it just exactly like they would be using it. And the fact that the image is coming remotely is completely transparent to them. So that's kind of one half. The other half is that we very carefully engineered then the implementation sensitive to the way that the IT administrator and the, and the hospital wants to see things. So what goes into the DMZ? What do we put on the LAN? We're very careful not to inject traffic onto the LAN, right? So we're very careful not to place additional load on the local PACS environment. So kind of the, the flow of load and who gets to talk to whom uh, has been very carefully engineered not to perturb the existing environment at all. But, but th this point is very important is, and, and a lot of effort, I wish I could lay claim to it, the Stefan Ebrisch uh, colleague here did a lot of the work of understanding the workflow within the healthcare provider and doing everything possible to ensure that the healthcare provider is not impacted. So people see this stuff, it, it's unbelievable because it seems very simple, right? They see what we can do and they just go completely crazy, right, because uh, in a good way, right, because it doesn't impact their workflow at all. They use all the off-the-shelf stuff that they're already using and all of a sudden they can get images remotely. And, and it seems like a little thing, but it's turned out to be huge. Thank you, Carl. If you want, Carl would be here for a day at least. So if you have more questions, please talk to him at lunchtime. Our third speaker is from the Czech Republic and the regional network, Cisnet, uh, Tomas Kulanek.
Uh, okay, I have. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, this presentation will be uh, about uh, the decentralized access to medical images in uh, research and enterprise packs we are just developing in Czech Republic, and we uh, we utilizing uh, previously presented Globus Medicus. Um, just short overview about the uh, about the organization I'm from. It's a Czech uh, Association of Universities and Czech Academy of Science, and. Uh, this organization operates on a national research and education network. You may see the uh, current topology. And this presentation, um, uh, first I will speak about medical imaging and about uh, uh, different systems to share uh, medical images. And then I will focus on uh, the centralization and uh, on utilizing uh, the grid. So as you probably heard from previous presentation, the DICOM is uh, an industrial standard protocol to exchange medical images. Uh, DICOM format is uh, generally supported by most of uh, um, healthcare devices. Um, picture arch archiving uh, and communication systems are deployed to manage data storage of DICOM images and uh, data flow of such images inside hospitals. Uh, so uh, when we share um, medical images uh, within one hospital, there is, uh, um, there is uh, um, systems which are quite matured. Um, however, uh, sharing uh, among uh, more than one institution brings uh, some uh, difficulties like uh, security issues and authorization issues, uh, which was mentioned in previous presentation. I, I would like to uh, speak about some uh, systems which exist in uh, Czech Republic, about the centralized storage system, which is called Medimed. And we have also some, um, some communication systems, which uh, secures the communications. So the Medibet project is uh, supported by the uh, university in Brno, and uh, it is a metropolitan digital imaging system in medicine, and uh, it's based on a central storage with several servers uh, in one place, uh, which is located in Brno. It's another town in Czech Republic. It connects hospital and other institutions and puts a DICOM to the MediMed via uh, some private network channels or via some secured channels via public internet. Uh, this project is uh, in clinical production and is used also for educational purposes. Um, next to the MediMed project, uh, the ReadyMed, uh, the another project ReadyMed, was developed uh, for exchanging images. Uh, the messages, uh, they are exchanging messages which contains a DICOM study and uh, other metadata about the DICOM. And uh, the messages are encrypted uh, by asymmetric key. And uh, additionally, it is also digitally signed. Thus, uh, the recipient may verify the identity of the sender. Uh, there is a uh, current uh, users of the uh, which are connected uh, to the ReadyMed. So you may see that uh, there are several uh, hospitals and also several practitioners uh, which are um, connected with uh, CESnet networks and another one they are not connected. They are connected via some other commercial internet service providers. I would like also to mention the uh, commercial solution for exchanging uh, medical images. It is the EPEX project, and uh, there are established uh, some VPN channels, and DICOM images are exchanges, exchanged uh, via this 
secured VPN channels. What is the general problem of the central element uh, of the system um, I showed already is that uh, the network topology degrades uh, to uh, the start to the start topology. So the central element is uh, or may behave as, as uh, a single point of failure. There are some solutions uh, to eliminate uh, single point of failure. For example, uh, load balancing among some uh, several nodes. As the grid technology generally allows uh, decentralization and may form a heterogeneous uh, large scale network uh, to establish virtual data capacity and each node may provide the same or a different set of services. And the centralized solution is more difficult to manage. Um, so we, um, we researched some uh, existing projects about uh, decentralization and uh, which utilizes the grid and we now uh, tried the Globus Medicus project which was presented previously. Um, it is very in very uh, beginning uh, stage. Um, we have uh, already connected uh, some grid nodes, uh, which is located in Prague, and we also connected with the existing uh, Medimet uh, project in Brno. So. Um, it is one positive that uh, it could be um, used uh, with uh, existing uh, uh, infrastructure. What we like uh, in uh, Globus Medicus is that uh, it is uh, standard based. Uh, we mm, We also enjoyed it, um, it is open source and we already customized and enhanced uh, some functionality. Uh, what are the issues? Uh, um, it's not the issues about the uh, Glomus Medicus, it's issues uh, in, uh, in Czech Republic and in the environment uh, uh, which are in hospitals uh, that uh, even the DICOM images uh, are stored in several nodes and are um, protected by strong encryption. It is uh, generally not uh, accepted uh, uh, for some hospitals. And there is another problem with uh, access control. Uh, um, it's possible to, uh, to uh, Uh, it's possible to uh, use uh, federated authorization, but uh, um, this one is uh, not also accepted by several hospitals. Uh, and uh, in a real situation, uh, um, the um, medicines and hospitals, they, they are uh, enough uh, satisfied with current uh, solutions and uh, the grid uh, technology and uh, grid infrastructure uh, would be uh, underutilized. So uh, we have uh, plans for future. Uh, I think the main plan for future is to, uh, to, uh, to extend the services provided by the Globus Medicus. We have uh, some challenge. Uh, for three-dimensional uh, reconstruction from the two-dimensional images. And uh, um, we also want to um, enhance uh, existing topologies of uh, the already existing systems. And uh, we plan also to, uh, to employ uh, this system uh, with, uh, uh, for educational purposes. There are some references, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas. 
Do you have any questions for him? No questions? So thank you very much. Um, I have been asked to remind you of the fact that we would all appreciate on the program committee if you would fill in the evaluations. You can either do it in paper, there are some paper evaluations downstairs at the registration desk, or on the web, of course. If you ask for, if you turn in a paper evaluation, you will get a gift. And I'm told it's a fantastic gift. And there's a rumor that it's something wonderful. I haven't seen it yet. So this is a teaser. We have, as I said in the f earlier remarks, a fourth speaker. It's Professor Shimizu from Kyushu University in Japan, who will set the stage for his demo, which follows <laughs> this. Okay, thank you very much, Jacqueline. Uh, and, uh, and thank you very much for giving me a chance to uh, uh, give you a brief explanation about our uh, live demonstration, which will be held, uh, you know, 1 p.m. Uh, for uh, about an hour. So, you know, I was told that I have only five minutes, so I just brought, um, you know, three slides, you know, but I could have, uh, you know, brought more than that, you know, but then, you know, nothing to do about it. So anyway, uh, I'm a, a medical doctor, surgeon, and I'm not an engineer. And... Uh, I've been uh, working a lot about uh, telemedicine uh, for five years. And uh, this is the fact, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, why we started this kind of uh, tele new kind of telemedicine. You know, the, uh, it may be odd or, you know, unbelievable for you advanced engineers that in the clinical medicine still, the ISDN, or at least the narrowband, is very, you know, I mean, the major system, you know, for the doctors to use. You know, the medical community, uh, you know, do not know even the existence of the research and the education network. You know, so this is what uh, they can do. Uh, so the, from the when I knew that there is a very, uh, you know, uh, high-speed uh, network, which can be applied to the uh, clinical medicine. You know, I, you know, uh, entered into this field, and uh, I found this is very attractive, and it, can, it has to be, you know, expanded in our community. So that's why, I, you know, we plan to uh, have the live demonstration here, you know, what kind of things we are uh, doing right now. So anyway... And the fact is that, an, you know, ISDN is, or narrowband can uh, transmit, uh, you know, very little amount of uh, information. Uh, so so the, uh, we uh, often uh, use only the still pictures, like a CT or pathology or something like that. And if we want to transmit the uh, moving images, like a surgery, uh, you know, it is, oh, I'm sorry, so it is always degraded, so the uh, quality get worse. But when we use the, uh, what we call the uh, DVTS, which stands for Digital Video Transport System, uh, you know, we can send, uh, uh, you know, a large amount of information. So uh, what happens is, uh, you know, the moving images uh, do, uh, you know, are not degraded, so we can transmit the original quality uh, to the remote areas. This is very important for the clinics because if the uh, images are degraded, it is very hard to make an accurate diagnosis or, we, you know, we surgeons cannot see the small vessels or thin membrane structures and so, so something like that. So the quality is very, very important. And the reason why this kind of uh, telemedicine is not so widely, uh, you know, used, available or used in the uh, medical community is that the quality is not good in telemedicine, co conventional telemedicine at least. So uh, what we are doing is something like this. 
you know, uh, often we uh, connect multiple stations, not to one-to-one, -one, but uh, we invite, you know, four stations or six stations and something like that. And uh, can I have the movies here? Is it possible? Or after, just after I uh, uh, finish the slide? Oh, yes. And could you uh, quickly, uh, you know, uh, skip? Yeah, the uh, yes. This is how we usually do it. Uh, case presentation. You know, we connect, uh, uh, you know, four Would stations. Please, and uh, uh, I forgot to tell you, but uh, this uh, system does not cost a lot of money. You know, all we need is just a computer and, uh, uh, you know, big network. So the, uh, you know, costless you is, the, you know, one of the key reasons why, you know, that, you know this is so expanded, you know, into the, you know, the uh, clinic, clinics right now. So could you go faster, you know, just uh, push the, in the middle of the ah, uh, movies? Oh, yeah, very good. Good now. Yeah, very good. good now. So, you know, okay. just skip. You know, I'm just Dr. Joe, and I'm very pleased yeah. to present this case. There was no fever or chilling sense, just and there the was no tenderness on abdomen. You know, go uh, faster. Total and belief, push uh, in the middle. Of total belief was in my own And then she... And then, uh, yeah. and then you know, go further. Please go further. You want to accept Even farther. Yes, I will explain the current. Yeah, and we, you know, uh, make the one screen into full screen so, so we can uh, enjoy we, the uh, surgery like this the, in a full, uh, uh, you know, so quality, you know, best quality. The, uh, during the okay, so go further. Uh, there, there, the momentum was Yeah, covered. so even farther. Yes, yes. Uh, go further. Uh, because uh, this patient is uh, we will even farther. See the. Uh, Dr. Han, okay, time, even farther. You can just stay and yeah. okay. I mean, yes. Yes. So we sometimes come back to this kind of things when we communicate each other. So yes. this is very helpful and this is very good for the education of the surgeons and something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Come back to the slide. So uh, this is what we are planning to do, uh, you know, in 30 minutes. So today we are going to uh, connect this venue to Rome, Italy, you know, by support of GAR, and to the uh, Singapore uh, University, uh, National University of Singapore, and then to our university in Japan. And uh, we will invite uh, recorded surgery or endoscopic demonstration using the model or, uh, you know, uh, simulators you know, surgical simulators or something like that. So uh, please stop by, you know, at our demonstration in the Bach room. Thank you very much. Any questions for Dr. Shimizu? Thank you, Shimizu. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed this session and it didn't put you off lunch. So the, as Dr. Shimizu said, this uh, demo will be at one o'clock and I'd like to thank all three others, other presenters as well. Thank you very much for excellent presentation.